<laughs> that wasn't my voice, by the way, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> I'd like if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts and chapter 10. We're still looking at Cornelius, and uh, we want to look particularly at the message that uh, was preached uh, to uh, Cornelius by Peter, uh, that first uh, Gentile convert of the New Testament era. So we want to break in in Acts 10, verse 33, and I'm going to read till the end of the chapter. It says in verse 33 of Acts chapter 10, immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good in healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew, and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then prayed they him to tarry certain days. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. Now, I want to do something different this morning to what I'm normally used to doing. And uh, what I want to do this morning is actually what the scripture says is contending for the faith. Because I, I do, I'm really concerned uh, about what I consider to be an error that is creeping in very subtly to the church today. And the reason I'm doing it this morning is because this passage is one of the passages that are used to justify this movement, you see, that is taking off and really affecting many people, even in our own circles. Now, I just want to say this right at the beginning, even as a, over the years as a believer in Christ, I have seen many, what I would say, Christian fads come and go. Uh, you know, for a while, they're, they're all the rage. And they have their own buzzwords that go along with them. And uh, uh, they're, they're really popular for a while until another fad comes along and they just seem to fade into the background. And now the latest bestseller is out. Usually it's a best-selling book that promotes this idea and promotes this kind of thing. And so I want to talk about something called the Disciple Making Movement or DMM. I'm going to use a lot of initials, DMM. I'm going to keep it simple because I don't want to waste my time on too much of this, but I have to say it because it's the reason I have to say it is because it's beginning to have effects in our circles. Now, what I mean by that is uh, CMML Magazine is starting to use some of these buzzwords, not just CMML Magazine, uh, Ken Keen's prayer information. This past week, some of the buzzwords were used 
in newsletters by different servants of the Lord. And I've even heard some DMM buzzwords from this platform. So it's closer than you even think. Okay. So what do we, what do we mean by all of these things? Well, this is the book that it all comes from contagious disciple making. This is the book. Okay. This is the, and I've read it. It was actually defiling to read. I have to say, I had to read two pages of C.H. McIntosh to every one page of this that I read just to keep my head straight. Uh, but it, nevertheless, it's a, it's a big deal and uh, it's really affecting a lot of people. It's a, a movement that has taken mission societies by storm and uh, it's uh, really affecting uh, places all across the globe. And of course, as I said, Cornelius is one of the passages that's used as an example of this. So what are we talking about? I'm going to give you key words, key buzzwords. Yeah, one of them you'll recognize, I'm sure. But um, the key buzzwords of DMM are obedience-based discipleship, person of peace, and discovery Bible study. OK, three things. Now, let me just say this. First of all, um, I, I think part of the reason these movements are successful is because we have failed in some of these areas. And we're not doing a great job of making disciples. And so any movement that seems to have solutions, and usually that's why these bestsellers do so well, is because it's kind of like, this is how you do it. We say, and we say, oh, great, I, I need to know how to do it. Off we go, we jump into it. And so obedience-based discipleship, person of peace. The one that you most likely will hear is the person of peace. Now, and I want you to just keep that in your mind because you, you'll pick it up once, once I've said it, you'll start seeing it. And the idea is this, that uh, a missionary or a disciple maker, what he does is he goes into a community and he walks around that community praying that the Lord would lead him to the person of peace. Or he might walk around a university campus until he finds this person of peace. And one of the examples of a person of peace is Cornelius, you see. And so now, of course, <clears throat> let me just say this. Uh, it's wonderful to come across people like Cornelius, whose heart God has been already at work in, right? We, it's wonderful when you meet somebody who is a prepared heart. But God saves people sometimes whose hearts don't seem to be very prepared. Saul of Tarsus wouldn't be a good person of peace, right? He's breathing out threats and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, and God gloriously saved them. And there have been many uh, absolute out-and-out -out rebel who would be characterized as anything but persons of peace who God has gloriously saved. Praise his name for that. But yeah, it's nice if we meet somebody who's like this, you know, that's the Lord has been working in. And so this is how they would define this person of peace. He's a bridge builder to the community. Uh, and that's our only job. Find this guy and everything's going to work out wonderful. They're open to a relationship with you. They hunger for spiritual answers to their deepest questions. And they're ready to share what they learn with others in their family and community. This unsaved but friendly character is going to be your key to reaching the community. And of course... Um, we might ask, well, where does all this come from? Well, this person of peace idea comes from Luke's gospel, chapter 10. I want you just to turn there for a second, Luke 10. And we'll see it um, explained quite clearly uh, wh where they get this from. Uh, Luke 10 and um, the Lord Jesus in verse one, after these things, the Lord appointed over 70. So it's the Lord sending the 70 out. Now, I want to just say some things here. The 70 that are being sent out, it's before Calvary and it's before Pentecost. And the 70 have been sent with a message really to prepare for the king, right? The king is here. The message of repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is kind of the, this is not, this is not Matthew 28 commission of the church, but this is where it comes from. And of course, there are principles here. Uh, verse two, therefore said, the harvest truly is great, labor is a few. Well, that's true, isn't it? Today, the harvest is great, labor is a few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'd send forth laborers to the harvest. Go your way, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And yet there's still people that are pretty hostile out there who are wolves. We've got to be careful. Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. Mind you, I don't see too many people going out without shoes on 
looking for their person of peace. But nevertheless, the idea is the Lord will provide. As you're about the master's business, the Lord will provide for you. And that's good to know that he does provide. And so it says, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. Or in the Jewish context, shalom. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And then in the same house, remain eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worthy of his hire, go not from house to house. And in whatever city you enter, that they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, heal the sick that are there, say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nigh to you, so on and so forth. And then, of course, he goes on and says that if they don't receive you, uh, then woe to them, it'd be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment. So this is where the idea of person of peace comes from, uh, from this verse. So you go searching for this person. Now, the idea of this son of peace, which is exactly the text says, it's kind of when you see son of, it means a person of the essential character. So uh, usually the Lord Jesus, son of God, right? What is his essential character? God, son of man, he's, he's human as well. Uh, but son of usually has the idea of essential character, uh, son of peace. And so the idea is this, as your ambassadors representing the king, it'd be good to stay at a place where there's somebody who's going to welcome you. And also somebody's going to be open to the message of the king. Yeah, that's a good thing. We want to, uh, and certainly you don't want to be with somebody who's a, a, a real conflict type person, because it doesn't look good for the king's messengers to be associated with that kind of thing. So, so the, I can see yeah, all that. And so the examples of Cornelius, Lydia, Philippian jailer would be quoted. And so I suppose we could go along to a certain degree with this, except for the fact that um, <clears throat> sometimes you go in a community and as you read the book of Acts, wherever Paul went, usually there was riots. Almost in every place. <laughs> Right. And and uh, and yet, despite that, God saved people through the proclamation of the gospel. So <clears throat> the second aspect is once you have found this person of peace, so you've found your man, you've gone around, you've been praying uh, and the Lord has led you to this individual. The next thing is you want to uh, get this individual to follow what's called obedience based discipleship. And so the thesis is based on the false assumption that when the Lord uh, called the 12, that these men were not converted when he called them. Now, Judas certainly wasn't. We can agree with that. But the idea was that he discipled them as unbelievers until they were converted. Now, again, I wonder, is that really true? So for one thing, many of them were John's disciples, weren't they? So as John's disciples, they had submitted to a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, right? In other words, they repented in light of the coming of the king. And so I think that they were at, at the very best Old Testament saints, right, in, in that sense. And, and so they, I, to say they were unbelievers, which is this whole thesis based on you are bringing unbelievers through obedience-based discipleship, and eventually, hopefully, they're going to get saved. Well, I, again, I, I have a question about that, because I, I think the thesis is based on a faulty assumption about the 12. The Lord took them under his wing and discipled them towards conversion, is what they would say. And again, uh, the difficulty with that is that I'm not sure that they were not true believers in that Old Testament sense of the world. But even if it was true, again, a, a massive change took place in Matthew 28. I want you to turn to Matthew 28. This is a key passage, I think, in refuting this whole system um, that is so popular in the world today. And, and Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go, therefore, and teach, or literally make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now, we're, we're told to make disciples. 
But I want to suggest to you the discipleship process begins with conversion. Okay. In other words, when somebody is converted, at that point, we want to teach them everything the Lord's commanded them. And the first thing that the Lord commanded was that when somebody's saved, they get baptized. Right. So the first hurdle in this life of obedience is, are you going to obey him at the waters of baptism? If you're not going to do that, you're not going to do anything else. Right. Basically, it's the first test, first hurdle. Will you obey in this? Once you do that, then you teach these new converts all things that God has commanded them. But that's not what DMM teaches. Obedience based discipleship begins with unbelievers. The goal of DMM and the disciple maker is helping the unbelieving disciple obey the commands of scripture daily as he moves towards conversion in Christ. Now, did anybody see any difficulty with that? I see a huge difficulty. For one thing is, if, if even if these unbelievers could obey the commands of Christ, it's going to produce self-righteous Pharisees who are going to think, well, I, I, I can do this thing. Whereas really what does scripture say? Romans 7 says the things that I, I should do, what do I do? I don't do them, right? The things that I shouldn't do, that's what I do. See, to expect unsaved people to, to live obediently to the commands of Christ is a big ask. Because we haven't dealt with a major problem. And that is they're sinners who need a savior and they need the spirit of God within them to enable them to live a life that pleases God. And so obedience-based discipleship, it, I believe, is the, there's massive success in this all around the world. But my question is, what is it producing? I wonder if it's producing apostasy. Right? Now, let me just, this is the scary part, I think. This is their definition of faith. And this is where I'm really concerned. This is page 15 of the book and the definition of faith. So we, we're trying to bring these people to trust in Christ. And so it says, in this form of teaching, faith is defined as being obedient to the commands of Christ in every situation or circumstance, regardless of the consequences. Let me read that again. Faith is defined as being obedient to the commands of Christ in every situation or circumstance, regardless of consequences. Well, is, that's not the definition of faith that I was taught, right? Faith is trusting in somebody who was obedient on our behalf, right? The only one that lived that perfect life and that died in our place and in our stead on Calvary's cross. It's my trust entirely in what he has done. It's not a life of obedience. Now, it might result in a life of obedience if I have genuine faith, but faith is not obedience. Faith is trust in what someone else has done. And so I think that's a very important thing. And of course, this, this obedience-based discipleship one of the major problems is Hebrews 11, 6, 6 says this, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you don't have faith to begin with, all the obedience in the world is not pleasing the Lord. It has to start with that point. And then the third aspect of it is discovery Bible studies. And how it works is that the, the disciple maker doesn't preach and he doesn't teach what he does is he gets them to study the Bible and he wants his, his person of peace actually to be the leader. He's, he's the man who gets him into the community. And so he's, he's the one who runs this study and they, they have questions that they read a text of scripture and then they have questions. What did I discover about God in this passage? That's a great question. What do you, when you read a passage, what, what does it teach me about God? But if I don't have the Holy Spirit to teach me the scriptures, how am I going to come to the right conclusion? Because the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God, their foolishness to it. And invariably, he's probably going to come up with the wrong conclusion. What do I th think about God in this passage? What do I discover about people in this passage? Again, good question. What does it teach me about people? How will I commit to obey this passage this week? Now, again, these, some of these principles would be great 
if we're dealing with Christians, like it would be good this morning if we said at the end of this message, how can I obey what I've heard this week? And we'll try and give you something to obey when we're done, right? It would be good to do that. But for a non-believer, uh, how will I commit to obey this passage this week? And then with whom shall I share what I've learned from this passage? You see, so this person of peace, and then the group that he works with, his family of peace and his connections, they become the, the way to get into the community and all the rest of it. Now, having said all that, let's go to our passage. I know this was a lengthy introduction and not a very pleasant one. Forgive me, but I just, I feel so burdened about this because I'm seeing it everywhere. And I just feel that the time has come to speak up and say something so uh and, and so now i've got to do this but i want to look at this passage and examine it in the light of what we've just heard certainly cornelius was a man who was um, a prepared heart and he certainly was an unbeliever even though he was somebody who uh, certainly was sincere in lots of ways different things like that but as we look at this passage you want to see what what did peter do as, quote, the disciple maker. How, what did he do? And, and this is what I'm going to just say. I'm going to say it right out now. But if the cases that they cite, so the Philippian jailer, Lydia, in every case, they didn't do a discovery-based Bible study. The disciple maker preached the gospel to them. That's what he did. So, so again, to jump to these conclusions, and that's why I found that book so disturbing, is because it, it, it's based on lots of assumptions that are not, when I look at my Bible, they're not in agreement. That's not what the disciple maker does. He preaches the gospel. And so let's just look at what Peter does. So it says in verse 34, well, let's just let's back up a bit. Verse 33 so it says, immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. And again, how wonderful it is when you meet people who want to know what God says, right? That's, I mean, I, I pray about this all the time. Lord, I would love to have a Bible study with a group of people who want to know what God says. That would just be thrilling. Unsaved people want to know what God says. It's a great thing. And certainly that's the case here. Cornelius wants to know everything God has to say. And so it says, verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Isn't that wonderful? God doesn't have favorites. Aren't you glad that he's not a respecter of persons? He's no favorites. Gospel is for everyone, whosoever. We're going we're gonna to reach that kind of climax of his message that whoever believes on him, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, you don't have any favorites. You can be Jewish. You can be Gentile. Uh, you can be uh, a, a Samaritan. It doesn't matter what your background ethnically is. It doesn't make any difference. God has no favorites. His message is for all men. Christ died for all men. The message is for all men. And so he says, God's no respecter of persons. And then he says, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, this has caused some people some confusion because uh, it, it would almost imply that acceptance is based on uh, working righteousness and all the rest of it. Well, let me just show you from chapter 11, which is really a review of this chapter 10. Now, look at chapter 11, and we'll see that uh, accepted with him is not equivalent to saved because it says in verse 13 and 14, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? And as I begin to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. And so what we would say is that Cornelius, for all his uh, you know, sincerity and all him being a genuine God-fearer, he still needed to hear words whereby he might be saved right and that's true you can meet some very pleasant people who are genuinely sincere but they still need to hear words whereby they might be saved and that's peter's mission is to give him those words that will describe the savior to them so they can believe on him and so certainly this man needed 
uh, to hear words whereby he could be saved. And so he's an unsaved man, sincere, he's seeking. Uh, praise God that there are people that are genuinely seeking. He is one of them. And, uh, and God is going to accept them, even though he's a Gentile and he's seeking. God is not going to say, well, I'm sorry, this is for Jews only, right? Uh, he's going to be accepted. Uh, wherever they are, whatever their background, if they're genuinely seeking after truth, God is willing to save them. But they still need to hear these words. So verse uh, 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. I love this verse. In fact, I actually did a, a, a whole series of gospel messages on this one text. Preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And it's true, isn't it, that nobody can experience peace with God without the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't experience peace with God if you ultimately reject the prince of peace right there's no peace says my god to the wicked peace can only come through the lord jesus and the idea of peace here that 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 word peace it, it actually essentially comes from a verb that means to be at one and you see we're not at one with god we're enemies of god before we're saved and so the only way men can be reconciled to god and be at peace with god is through the message of jesus christ and by the way, he is Lord of all. Isn't that wonderful? Peter, recognize that. Christ is Lord of all. He, he's the one who we must uh, believe in. We must trust in him. So he goes on and presents the gospel message. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now, remember, Cornelius is a Roman centurion based in Caesarea, which was the Roman headquarters of the, the land, what we call the land of Israel. And so everything Jesus did, this man would be aware of. Like he, he's not ignorant of these things. And so he says, Peter says, you know, he knew all about Jesus and he knew about the cruci. He, he'd heard all this stuff before because, because that's his job, right? He's in the, the, the police department or the army or whatever, the military. And so he, he knows what's been going on in the land and he knows about these things. And Peter knows he knows it. So he says, you know, it was published throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism John preached. And so he begins to preach from John's baptism, that baptism of repentance that John preached. And he saw, so that's his starting point. And now what I'm going to do is kind of just talk about each verse in terms of who did what. I, I find it kind of interesting. Verse 38 is what he did, speaking of the Lord Jesus. As he talks about John, uh, the ministry of Jesus, he tells us what he did. And this is just a delightful description. And by the way, before, in case I forget it, it's also a marvelous Trinitarian verse. Because you have all three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, mentioned in the scripture. And so it says in verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, so there's God the Father, God the Son, with the Holy Ghost, there's the Holy Spirit, and with power, who went about doing good and healing the, all that were oppressed of the devil. Now, I want you just to see a, a simple contrast here. We, we have this statement, Jesus healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And then we already considered the statement preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that a marvelous contrast? Coming to faith in Jesus Christ will result in peace. Ignoring Christ Jesus is going to result in oppression by the devil. And there's, there's only two camps. There, there's no other option. You're either under the oppression of the devil or you're enjoying peace through Jesus Christ. And that's the way it is. There's just two options. And, and uh, you know, the devil... I, we should, be, we should be mad at him every single day. He's come to steal and kill and destroy. And everywhere you look, you see what he is doing in this world. And the only healing solution is the Lord Jesus. He's the only one that can sort the mess out 
of a life the devil has brought down to degradation and sin and bondage, Christ alone can make men free, nobody else. Preaching peace by Jesus Christ. And so this Jesus, what did he do? What did he do? Well, he went around doing good. And of course, that's the gospels in a nutshell, isn't it? The description of the good that he did, the marvelous teaching, never man spake like this man, the, the marvelous miracles that he did, even the enemies had to say, this man doeth all things well. Just incredible. He went about doing good. So this is what he did. Now, what did they do? <laughs> Notice what it says in verse 39. We are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And so the apostles, what they did is they, they spread this message. But what did the Jews do? It says, in response to this one who went about doing good, it says, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. That a, what a response. He went about doing good, and they slew and hanged on a tree. What a response. And what's interesting is that response was the response of the unbelieving world of that day, including the Jews who were religious unbelievers. They didn't believe in the claims of Christ. And then you had the Romans who were the politicians of the day this is the political power and then of course the greeks was the culture of the day and on the cross it's written right in three different languages this is jesus king of the jews and it's written in hebrew it's written in latin it's written in greek and what the implication is that all the political power the um the cultural power and the religious power was antagonistic towards the lord jesus and that's not changed has it and that be true? Religion hates the gospel of Christ. It really does. Hostile towards it. The political world hates the gospel of Christ. And the cultural world hates the gospel of Christ. And so there, it says, this is what they did, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. So what did God do? We saw what Jesus did. We saw what they did. Now what did it says, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. They rejected his claims. They, they, they said, we will not have this man. And, and as it were, God the Father overturned it all. And he rose him from the grave the third day. They said, he's not who you said he was. He's who he said he was. He really is the Messiah. And he raised him from the dead. And he overturned the whole thing. How marvelous what God did. Him God raised up the third day, and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses be chosen before of God, even to us, the apostles, those men were chosen to be witnesses of the resurrection, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead, and so he's no phantom, they actually ate and drank with him, which does mean that we'll still eat in our resurrection body, isn't that good to know? You mean heaven will include food, we don't need it to survive, but we'll enjoy it. In fact, there won't be any calories. That would be the nice thing about it. We, <laughs> we can eat it without worrying about pounds. You know, that would be so nice. <clears throat> but it says we did, we did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And then it says, <clears throat> and he commanded us to preach, verse 42, unto the people, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be judge of quick and dead. He wants us to know what Jesus will do in the future. Yeah, he died on the cross. He rose again. But the next time the world's going to see him, he's going to be the judge. And he will judge all men. Kurt had no idea what I was going to be saying this morning, but he read from John 5. And John 5 is a glorious passage that says that all judgment has been given to the Son. And so every human being who was ever born into this world will have to face and deal with Jesus Christ. Every human being. And he will be the judge. Now, here's the interesting thing, and I want to just emphasize this, because, you see, even believers, they'll have a judgment, but it will be the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll be judged for our service 
after conversion, not for our sin, because our sin was already judged on Calvary. Amen. Right? My sin, I love this hymn, I, I often quote it, all this, all the, my sin, all the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And so when I trusted Christ as my Savior, my sin, which was all future, when, when, I, when, when Christ died, everything that happened to me, I was a long time after that, over 2,000 years down the pike. So every, all my sin was future when Christ died, but he died for all my sin, past, present, future. And he paid the penalty. And so my sin has already been judged, and it will never be judged again. In fact, the truth of the new covenant, we just broke bread and we had a cup of wine. And it says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And that new covenant says this, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember them no more. He will never bring a believer's sin up to him again. Praise God for that. Isn't that wonderful? It's dealt with. It's judged. My service will be judged, not my sin. But for the unbeliever, who has not trusted in Christ as their sin bearer, they will be judged on account of their sin. And the Lord Jesus will open the books. And those books is going to be, this was your life. And it'll be a record of everything you did and everything you thought about doing. Just think about that. And it will all be brought before you and he'll be brought before you for one purpose, to show if you're not saved that you're guilty and God is righteous to send you to hell because the evidence will be overwhelming. And the scripture says every mouth will be stopped. You might think now, well, well, I didn't have a, a good upbringing and I had all these difficulties. Every mouth will be stopped. Every objection will be silenced and all the world will be guilty before God. And you will acknowledge the justice of God in sending you to hell. And so that's why it's important in the light of what he will do in the future is what you must do now. If you want to avoid that scenario, if you, if you want to have, as it were, the, the, the pages of that book, your record of earth, blotted out there's something you must do and so he says in verse verse 43 to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins isn't that wonderful Amen. not whoever lives a life of obedience to christ from now on right that's not the right definition of faith Right? Faith does not mean obedience. It results in obedience. But what faith means is trusting in the Lord Jesus as your sin bearer and your savior. Whoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And isn't it a wonderful thing to have your sins remitted? To no longer be obligated for them. It's the debt is paid. It's all dealt with. It's finished. When Jesus said it's finished, he meant it's finished. Nothing to pay. All paid for by the Lord Jesus. Every bit. And so it says, whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. Well, Peter yet spake these words. Notice this. The Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. In other words, they were born again. That's what we would use, that term. They were born. They became new creatures in Christ. Now, what's interesting is, I want you to notice, Peter's still preaching. They didn't pray a prayer. I want you to notice that. They didn't say, uh, you know, kind of the sinner's prayer. They just heard and believed that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of this. And they believed it in their hearts and they were saved. You see, the difficulty with the sinner's prayer is that, well, did I say it right? Or was I sincere when I said it? And there are a lot of people that said the sinner's prayer that really have struggles because they're looking at what they did rather than what he did. 
right? Belief is in the finished work of Christ. And they believed that in their hearts. And while they believed without walking the aisle, you know, that? they didn't walk the aisle, didn't pray a prayer, didn't raise their hands. They just listened and they believed the message that Christ died for them and that he was better and he rose again. They believed that in their hearts. And it says the spirit came upon them. Praise God. That's how simple it is. Just believe it in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That's the, it's the message of faith, isn't it? Well, what about as many as received him? That's often quoted, really, right? Isn't it? As many as received him. So you've got to receive him. And in order to receive him, you've got to pray the sinner's prayer. Well, look at John's gospel, chapter one. Let's consider that passage just for a second. Because it's kind of interesting in John chapter one. <clears throat> it says um, in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power or authority to become the sons of God. And then it says, what? Even to them that believe on his name. How did they receive him? They received him by believing on his name. And that means they believed everything about him, what he, who he was, what he did. They believed it. And when they believed it, they received it. And as they received him, they were given the authority, the right to be the sons of God wonderful to believe and so it says <clears throat> verse 45 and they of the circumcision which believe were astonished as many as came with peter now peter's got these guys that have come with him and they're going to be very important when we get to chapter 11 because they're going to be witnesses that the gentiles were saved on the same basis as the jews and the evidence is going to be that the spirit of god came on them like he did on the jews on pentecost and they spoke in tongues like the Jews did on the day of Pentecost. And so these are essential witnesses to get the Jews to accept this horrible thought to many of them that God was actually going to save Gentiles. Because they're dogs, remember. They don't like the Gentiles. And so it says, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water? These should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as, as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice that this is an important verse. He didn't say to them, you know, now you're a believer. I think it might be a good idea if you considered believer's baptism. In fact, in a few months, we're going to be having a course and we're going to be, you know, having classes, getting ready for baptism. No, he commanded them. See, the life of discipleship is now kicking in. And life of discipleship is obeying all things that I have commanded you. And the first thing he's commanded is baptism. Right? So in other words, if you're saved, you should be baptized. Right? The idea of an unbaptized believer is just not found in the New Testament. Somebody gets saved. They witness to what's happened to them by being baptized. They witness to their faith in the triune God because you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they're saying, we believe that the, the name singular of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, we believe there's one God who eternally existed in three persons. It's a great confession. And then when they're baptized, they're saying, I believe that Jesus died just as, it, and, and as they go into the water, that, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. And I believe that, and I want to testify publicly to that. And, and so, certainly, we, we want obedient disciples. But my contention is that this disciple-making movement is putting the cart before the horse. It's wanting people to be obedient before they've obeyed the gospel and believed in the finished work of Christ. And that's where it all begins. You'll never live a life of obedience to God while ever you are rejecting his son whom he loved and sent into the world. You want to live a life of obedience, it starts there at the cross. What will you do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Whoever believes on him shall receive remission of sins. And so, forgive me for having to load this but it's not just for you this is going to go out on the internet and it's important that it goes out on the internet because because this stuff is really creeping in and it's a perversion of the gospel 
Now, I'm not saying that everybody who writes in a prayer letter, pray for a person of peace, has bought into the whole, I have no idea. But the very fact that terminology is creeping in, just an aside, this is the final thing I'm going to say, and I'm going to close in prayer. But be careful in our terminology. We use a lot of terminology that's not biblical, like addiction. I'm interested, the Bible doesn't talk about that. It talks about slavery. Sin is enslaving. In fact, the only addiction word I can think of is uh, in a, used in a very positive sense. The house of Stephanus were addicted to the ministry of the saints. Oh, I love that kind of addiction. That, Lord, give us people addicted to the ministry of the saints. But the Bible talks about sin being enslaving. And so it's, <laughs> we talk about alcoholism. An alcoholic. Scripture never, ever mentions those terms. It says drunkard. See, God would never send anybody to hell for a disease. It's not a disease. It's choices that people make. And so, again, terminology really matters. And, uh, you know, I, I just feel like one of the things about these last days, the scripture says there's going to be a lot of deception. And so we have to be men and women of discernment who don't just believe it because it's a bestseller written by a supposed Christian. Check it out, right? Be a Berean. Study these things out and see if they really are true. Search the scriptures. And that's what we want to do. We want to be people of the book. But I want to just say again, if there's somebody here this morning and you... You may be a very well-respected person, just like Cornelius. He was well-respected. The Jewish people had a lot of good things to say about him. But he still needed to hear words whereby he must be saved. And so however respected you are, the bottom line is this. Has there been a point in your life where you have seen yourself as a sinner who needs a savior and has trusted in the only savior of sinners that is ever revealed in history, the Lord Jesus. Have you ever trusted Christ? Has there ever been a time when you have believed whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins? And if not, this would be a good morning to do it. <laughs> because the alternative is if you don't believe on him as your savior you certainly will believe on him as your judge because you're going to be looking into his eyes but it'll be too late then so there's a real urgency here because to him god has given the responsibility to judge the living and the dead and every human being We'll look into his eyes. Let's pray. Our Father, we just uh, again would ask if there's one here who's never trusted Christ, has never believed on him, that's never come to that place where they realize that I am the sinner Jesus died to save. Lord, this morning would be a wonderful time. And then for ourselves, Lord, we, we just recognize we're living in what the Bible says perilous times. And they are perilous times. And we need to be those that discern the times and know how to act and lord we have to study your word we have to be bereans we have to test all things prove all things and hold fast to that which is good and lord yeah we feel rebuked lord because we've not done a good job of making disciples and we really could uh, improve in that area where we freely acknowledge that but lord we want to do it biblically and follow your word. So help us in these things, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.